Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for Who Speaks, For Whom, and How with Olufemi Taiwo and David Garneau. First things first, we're recording this session. My name is Jack Renee Bruno, and I'm the editor at C Magazine, as well as the director of and close collaborator on the Curious Criticism Symposium, alongside Lorraine Fournier and Maya Wilson Sanchez. With a focus on form, curious criticism plays on curious as a method, as well as a descriptor for certain creative critical leanings. The series seeks to facilitate deep, meaningful engagement with the objects, texts, images, and experiences that we encounter in art, considering all the while what it means to do so in the midst of global crisis. The symposium brings together writers, critics, artists, curators, and other thinkers to take up these questions in relation to their manifold practices. Uh, and so you can see a list of events on our site, which Alex, our AV technician, has just posted into the chat or will post into the chat. And uh, so just a little rundown on how this is going to go. The talk will run for about 45 minutes, followed by an audience Q&A. Um, you're encouraged to add questions to the chat at any point. You can also use the button that says raise your hand. So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that C Magazine's offices are located in Toronto or to Toronto, a Mohawk word meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing, which is said to refer to the wooden stakes that were used as fishing weirs in the narrows of local river systems by the Haudenosaunee and Huron-Wendat peoples. These lands are also the traditional and ancestral territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Anishinaabek. Bearing in mind the complexities of acknowledging the land in the midst of an ongoing colonial project, we continue to do so at Sea Magazine as an expression of gratitude for our hosts and in the effort to encourage our audiences to embody this acknowledgement in their daily lives in all of the ways that are possible for them. So it's a great pleasure tonight to have Olufemi, Taiwo, and David Garneau here with us. In tonight's conversation, they'll discuss who can speak for whom and how. It's a set of questions that has been inextricable from my experience working in arts publishing as a writer and a reader, but especially as an editor, a role in which I support people as they formulate thoughts about work made by others. For more, uh, more than a decade ago, I, I came across Linda Martine Alcoff's The Problem of Speaking for Others, which was first published in 1991. In that essay, Alcoff summarizes the problem as hinged on the widespread acceptance of two claims. Number one, that where one speaks from affects both the meaning and truth of what one says, and thus that one cannot assume an ability to transcend their location. In other words, standpoint epistemology. And number two, that not only is the speaker's location epistemically salient, but that certain privileged locations are discursively dangerous. Specifically, she says, when a more privileged person speaks for a less privileged one. I'm gonna read a little bit here since while I was rereading this essay in advance of this event, it was uncanny to me how closely Alcoff's ponderances around this from 30 years ago resembles what I've been observing recently. So quote, you might say that I should only speak for groups of which I am a member, but this does not tell us how groups themselves should be delimited. For example, can a white woman speak for all women simply by virtue of being a woman? If not, how narrowly should we draw the categories? The complexity and multiplicity of group identifications could result in communities composed of single individuals. Moreover, the concept of groups assumes specious notions about clear cut boundaries and pure identities. I am a person of mixed ethnicity and race, she says, half white Angla and half Panamanian Mestiza. I have membership in many conflicting groups, but my membership in all of them is problematic. Group identities and boundaries are ambiguous and permeable, and decisions about demarcating identity are always partly arbitrary. Another problem concerns how specific an identity needs to be to confer epistemic authority. Reflection on such problems quickly reveals that no easy solution to the problem of speaking for others can be found by simply restricting the practice to speaking for groups of which one is a member. Adopting the position that one should only speak for oneself raises similarly difficult questions. And that's the end of that quote. For Alcoff, the latter, which she calls retreat, is difficult because the significant focus of her text is rooted in her desire to leverage her own position as a feminist academic to advocate for the rights of those who don't have similar platforms and the attendant clout to advocate for themselves. 
which is not a dissimilar problem to critics who want to write about artists whose work is underrepresented and underdiscussed, but get tangled in the question of their suitability for the task based on their subject positions and or on their mystification around the ethics of intersubjective creative critical engagement. Some think the risk of getting it wrong is an important one to take if the alternative is continued silence around a given, per a given person's work, sorry. Others outright choose to refrain, stepping back into a quote unquote listening role, which may in some cases be productive, progressive or space making, but may conversely also affirm privileged people in their non-involvement. Non and by that, I mean political non-involvement. Uh, yeah, which I could say more about, but I'll leave it to the, to our guests. Um, not to mention that retreating does not produce a one-to-one -one vacancy that is swiftly filled by an ideal party. And I've seen this many times over, um, that someone who feels unequipped for some reason to uh, to write about somebody else's work steps back and there is no there is no suitable person waiting in the wings to step in and take up that work. So needless to say, I was immediately drawn to what Femi Taiwo calls deference epistemology, or in other words, the means that are put into practice in order to practice standpoint epistemology and the effects of those practices on oppressed people, which are often in direct opposition to the intentions that might colloquially be referred to as passing the mic, especially when this is practiced in elite spaces, which the art world, of course, is. In his essay, Being in the Room Privilege, Elite Capture and Epistemic Deference, Femi makes the compelling point the so-called listening has less often meant setting up video calls with people in refugee camps and more often applied to matters of conversational authority. And notably, regardless of, of what the recipients of that authority do or do not know or have or have not experienced. As he writes, if we want to use standpoint epistemology to challenge unjust power arrangements, it's hard to imagine how we could do worse. David Garneau is the longtime advocate for intersubjective exchange and practices of critical care when it comes to reading art, especially art made by indigenous folks, regardless of who's doing the writing. In an essay he wrote for C Magazine's Deja Vu issue, he addresses some of the exact shortcomings of standpoint epistemology that Femi analyzes, and I quote, a favored tactic for settler art magazines, galleries, and museums responding to the reconciliation, decolonization, and indigenization surge is to cede display territory and temporarily. That is, they celebrate indigenous resilience, showcase native pride, display Aboriginal pain, and otherwise, quote unquote, hold space. Their concern appears to be with filling the space with anything indigenous rather than being concerned with the critical quality of the contribution. These actions are designed to momentarily represent, but not to engage the indigenous beyond that moment. Making, holding, and sharing space reinforces settler ownership of these display territories critical engagement jeopardizes authority on both sides. A lack of critical care reifies settler indigenous binaries. It encourages indigenous folks to occupy the appearance of a position rather than to earn one. The refusal to engage indigenous art and persons critically positions us as permanently in a representational rather than a dialogic mode, as transmitters rather than generators of knowledge. Olufemi Taiwo is an assistant professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. His research and teaching focuses on social and political philosophy and ethics, with an emphasis on figures and themes out of anti-colonial and anti-capitalist intellectual and activist histories, including the Black radical tradition. His forthcoming book, Reconsidering Reparations, which looks like it's coming out this month through Oxford University Press, considers linkages between climate justice and reparations. David Garneau is Professor of Visual Arts at the University of Regina. His practice includes painting, curation, and critical art writing. He's interested in creative expressions of contemporary Indigenous identities. Garneau recently curated and co-curated major exhibitions in Montreal, New York City, Sydney, and Regina. His essays include From Indian to Indigenous, Temporary Pavilion to Sovereign Display Territories in the book In Search of Expo 67, which came out in 2020 and Electric Beads on Indigenous Digital Formalism in the Visual Anthropology Review in 2018. Garneau has given keynote talks in Australia, New Zealand, the States, and throughout Canada on issues such as misappropriation, public art, museum display, and contemporary Indigenous art. His paintings are in numerous public and private collections. 
So without further ado, I will hand it over to Femi and David. Thanks you all, thank you all for coming. Wow, <clears throat> thanks for that uh, thorough introduction um, and for setting the stage of our conversation. Um, I would like to begin, if you don't mind, I'm going to read a little, sort of little deeper uh, territorial acknowledgement of the land that I'm sitting upon right now. And uh, one short paragraph, pretty much echoing everything you said. <laughs> so the numbered treaties are legal and sacred covenants between the crown and the original inhabitants and stewards of the Great Plains and North Central Woodlands of the territory now known as Canada. The crown is the legal name of the British government whose rights in this matter were transferred to Canada's crown uh, at Confederation in 1867. According to British law, Canada's legal existence depended upon securing written settlements with the people who were here first. Treaty 4, where I'm at, signed in 1874, is an agreement between on one side settlers, their heirs, but also anyone accepting the social contract of becoming a Canadian. And on the other side, people then known as Indians, in this case, the Nehewa, which is the Cree, the Anishinaabeg, formerly known as Soto, and the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota folks, also known as Assiniboia peoples. The spirit of the treaties is that in exchange for sharing their land, First Nations people are compensated, have reserved lands, and special rights in perpetuity. Elders understand the treaty is also with the creator. It's a sacred obligation that includes our other than human relations. For indigenous people, the idea of title to land and its surrender is inconceivable. Treaty is an agreement to share responsibly. I acknowledge that in addition to the treaty signatories, the land was shared in this area, was shared at various times by the Métis, Blackfoot and ancient others. Uh, for our American visitors, I'm, I'm part of the Métis group, which is recognized by the Canadian uh, constitution as an indigenous people. And the Métis are like American Creole if they organized and became an almost nation. Um, I'm a descendant of Riverlot people, Eleanor and Laurent Garneau, who in 1872 moved from Red River to uh, Edmonton in Treaty 6, where I grew up. And I'm a grateful guest here in Oscana, Regina, Treaty 4. So I'm just to say a quick statement. Um, I should let you know that I'm not a proper scholar. I'm a Métis artist, curator, critical writer, and I teach painting and drawing. I occasionally have taught some theory courses at the grad level, but mostly I just teach people how to paint and draw. When I'm thinking of myself as a critical writer, I always think of myself as a Métis critical writer or a critical arts writer. To drop that indigenous prefix, to simply call myself a critical writer would imply an objectivity I don't sustain. I'm an interested, not a disinterested critic. Interested criticism reads the present as foreshadowing the future the author can abide. Writing critically while indigenous means calling out colonialism and nudging readers towards co-producing non-colonial tomorrows. Interested criticism can be chided for confirmation bias, looking for evidence to support your beliefs and refusing contrary facts, which is only a problem if your beliefs are mistaken, only an obstacle if you claim to describe reality neutrally rather than openly desire to shape it creatively. My critical art writing is in part speculative nonfiction, creative critical inquiry that attempts to influence the future reception of present things and offer theoretical support for the yet to be made. Thank you. So I wanna um, maybe just start by, uh, I'll introduce myself um, and say a little bit about how I relate to art because uh, like David, I'm not a proper, um, I'm not proper in a sense. I'm not a proper art critic in my, in my case. Um, so I do teach philosophy at Georgetown, where I work on primarily social political philosophy. Um, so neither am I a philosopher of art and aesthetics, which is uh, related to stuff that I do and stuff that I think about. And I have a lot of colleagues who I work with who do 
to work in that area, but it's not my kind of central area. Um, so I think of my relationship to this topic actually primarily at the intersection of my life as an artist. Uh, I've been, you know, I've been involved in music and dance for most of my life um, and a fan, right? Somebody who likes to listen to music, somebody who likes, you know, I, I wish I could <laughs> explain why I like the paintings that I like. Maybe David can help me with that, but, you know, somebody who appreciates art, somebody who really enjoys it and gets a lot out of engaging with it, right? Um, so, um, as I just mentioned, my relationship to art is primarily as an artist. I grew up playing, uh, playing music, you know, different instruments, so on and so forth. Um, I was one of the band nerds, which is something of a nerd archetype here in the States. Right. Uh, I played saxophone in band and so on and so forth. So I played in uh, our, the jazz band that we had at school. So um, by the time I was an adult, I had something of a foundation. So I would go into um, being able to play at church, um, the African-American church in Indiana, which is where I went to high school and college, um, playing in more serious bands later on in life. Um, and nowadays I still make music, so on and so forth. So that's my relationship to art, primarily music, but you know, I enjoy lots of art as most people do, right? Um, but what I have to say about art criticism is more, as I said before, from my perspective as um, an artist and a fan of art. Um, and I, I just want to kind of raise this ambivalence that I have um, so that we can talk about it. Um, but what I'm ambivalence, what I'm ambivalent about is a kind of art criticism that I feel like is more prominent in the last decade or so than when I was growing up. Um, and that art criticism uh, emerged around what were then new artists like uh, Cardi B, uh, uh, Migos, Miley Cyrus, Bruno Mars, Justin Timberlake, um, as well as a kind of discourse, a kind of contribution to discourse around art that cropped up when established artists went in new directions like Kanye West, and I'm using music because that's the world I know a little bit better, but I'm sure there's analogs of this in, in film and television. And I saw these think pieces engaging in what struck me as kind of social political criticism with music as something of a jumping off point or these particular artists as something of, as a jump, jumping off point. So, so what does the success of Bruno Mars tell us about racial ambiguity? Or what does the career pivots of Miley Cyrus and Justin Timberlake tell us about the broader consumptive relationship of the white public to black art? You know, these, these kinds of points. And my ambivalence is the fact that I thought both that these pieces of art criticism made important points that are well worth discussing. But I also thought that something broader was happening in terms of how prevalent these kinds of art criticism uh, takes and articles were becoming. You know, 10 years ago, they seemed like the exception to me. Now they seem like the rule. I don't know if it's just because of my particular you know, news feed on Facebook or Twitter, or if there's something deeper going on there. But, you know, by the time I read the 20th or 30th one of these essays, you know, I started thinking, do these people even like music? The people who are, um, you know, tra trafficking these kinds of art criticisms exclusively or primarily. Right. Do lyrics, melody, harmony play any role um, or play an important role in the way that they think about 
music, the way that they consume music, the way that they communicate about music, or is it mostly this kind of music as an entry point into conversations? And one of the reasons I found this so alienating um, and the reason I'm so ambivalent about it is because I felt that it was very different from the musical culture that I felt that I had inherited. You know, that's not to say that it was never important who you were and what your background was in previous eras of musicianship. But at the end of the day, there were ways of developing a real or at least authentic enough relationship to a musical history to have a place in it. And that was developing the skill or crafts that were particular to that kind of music, right? Um, maybe you were from the Delta, maybe you were from New York, but if you could swing, you could swing, right? Um, anybody who played with the level of skill of Oscar Peterson or Hiromi Weihata or you know, or John Coltrane would have a place in jazz, not necessarily the central place, right? Um, because it does have a deeper cultural significance. But no one would, you know, no one would ask why you were there, or at least I didn't feel that that was quite as prominent as it seems to me to be now. So the question that I want to raise based on this ambivalence is um, a kind of, I just want to try out a distinction. I think there's the changing the subject problem in and of itself. So there's this other thing that we can do with art criticism other than reflect on the artistic qualities of the thing we're criticizing or the artists we're criticizing. But I think there's two kinds of people that can engage in that sort of criticism. And I think they, there's two kinds of outsiders, let's say, that can engage in that kind of criticism that maybe influence how we should think about this phenomenon. So there's people outside the cultural community that produces the art. So uh, maybe white criticisms of black artists or settler criticisms of indigenous art fit into this kind of category. Um, but I th think what I'm also drives ambivalence is a different kind of outsider notion. Um, people outside the music community criticizing art on what strike me as non-musical grounds. So maybe activists criticizing the moral content of music um, uh, in ways that are called for, but nevertheless are fraught in their own ways. And I think both of these groups of outsiders should get to criticize art, should get to engage with art, but there's a kind of ecological system level question of, are these kinds of criticisms taking up too much space? Are these kind of critics taking up too much space or taking up space inappropriately, so on and so forth. So I know I've rambled on, I'll leave it there. Wow, so much to jump into. Um, I share some of your ambivalence or anxiety. I would say um, I graduated quite a long time ago with a BFA in painting and drawing and was looking at going on to do an MFA but I was also writing at the same time, this would be about 30 years ago. And uh, I was noticing that really good writers were invading what I thought is uh, our territory, the visual, and they were coming from poetry and they had all this great um, continental philosophy going on. And uh, it was quite a challenge because most of the visual artists were not as good as writers. And so they were plowing in. And so I actually, it's not the only reason, but it was one of the main reasons why I did a degree in a master's degree in English literature is because I want to get to know what they were learning. The second struggle, I've had a lifelong struggle with non-objective sculpture and painting. I'm not a fan. And the main reason I'm not a fan is because it seems an avoidance of uh, contemporary, anything that's non that's not formal about contemporary, but all the issues. And uh, there was an essay years ago by Chavez, who was writing about the masculine nature of, uh, say, Richard Serra, um, its failure to engage with the Vietnam War, all this sort of thing. And, and that had such a strong impact on me. And then as a Métis person, uh, coming to finally being able to write about Indigenous art, 
I realized that I was always going to be interested. I couldn't be disinterested. I couldn't occupy um, either in making work or writing about work that didn't have something to say. Um, I love that I'm talking to someone who's got an interest in music because the two groups you were comparing were the lyric uh, oriented folks against the, the formalists, you know, Oscar Peterson's and the one who, well, they did do singing now and then, but they're mostly known for their non-objective, you could say, um, sounds. And that to me has always been a great challenge. I love uh, non-lyric music, but I have a trouble with the painting and I shouldn't. At the same time in Washington, I've gone to see a few Rothko's and so on that have made me stop. And my and I, I see it as a spiritual, I find with music too. So I've got that same kind of anxiety and ambivalence. So I see it as a form of social work when I'm writing critically about content oriented things. And I decided a long time ago simply to no longer engage. I was writing quite strongly, critically once a week, sometimes more frequently in the 90s. But I found that rather than talking about things that I didn't like so much, I would mostly promote the things I did and explain why. And the main reason why is I thought that critical writing should, as its first agenda, understand the project that the artist was engaging in. And hopefully, especially in larger formats like uh, catalog essays, try to offer back as a letter back to the artist things that might be happening they might not comprehend. And that's been my greatest satisfaction. And so I think it always as a certain for the object and especially before the practice. And the critique that you offer, I think, really comes from early writers when they get the social competency required to be a critical person. And so they get all the necessary tropes and positions, and then they deploy them against an object that responds or corresponds with their inquiry. Um, and then they avoid those things that don't respond or correspond. And so that's a lack of humility before the object. You should, as a critic, come towards these things in order to be transformed. And I wasn't going to quote Bill Hooks, but I can't help myself. I'm not going to quote her exactly, but she was formative in my critical thinking. Her essay on uh, Basquiat, The Altars of Sacrifice, just the first few paragraphs where she talks about an affective engagement um, and that people were failing. They, they wanted to go to his autobiography right away. They weren't co-responding with the work and it left her quite distressed and then had her engaged. Um, and she actually does somewhat some readings of work. But where this kind of criticism falls down is often they're talking around the work, rhetorician talking around it, rather than going right to it and trying to understand what that artist project is, not in a global sense, but in this particular piece. And I see critical writing as a form of recognition. And for Indigenous people, it's literally recognition. I know some people have written against the necessity of anybody other than Indigenous people recognizing or, yeah, recognizing Indigenous folks. But I see that as something we're always looking for in order to form ourselves, even if it's against something else. But also a recognition. I have to change my mind every time I encounter a great work of art. Um, Kent Monkman, so the essay I wrote for C, I love Kent Monkman's work. I think it's incredibly important. Um, but as I really sat with just this one picture for a long period of time, I was trying to understand why I was discomforted with it. And how could I write about that without throwing mud on this important indigenous artist? It was a real struggle. So it's sort of a doubly meta text that's got kind of a, a little fiction thing happening at the beginning. It's my struggling towards a kind of uh, non-colonial uh, creative critical writing and I don't know how close I'm getting to it but anyways it's a start <laughs> yeah I, I was struck by the way that you put the point about the lack of humility towards the object right the object of 
potentially critical engagement, you know, the art. Because I think, I both think that's really apt and it helps, it helps me get further in explaining um, that ambivalence that I feel and that sounds like we both feel to myself. Um, because I think in the absence of that humility towards the object, what happens instead of an, what happens instead of a kind of at least potentially reciprocal engagement with the artist, like we get this more extractive seeming relationship mm. where, you know, your art and by extension, your thoughts, feelings, commitment, whatever drove you to make that piece in the way that you made it, you know, those become objects of management rather than objects of genuine engagement. And, and so, yeah, so maybe, you know, maybe that, that kind of moves me in a different direction than I started with. You know, at first I was kind of like, well, I think maybe there's a problem with this kind of criticism, but, you know, the important thing is just that it's not the dominant or only kind of criticism. Um, but now I'm starting to think, well, no, maybe, you know, maybe there really is something up with this kind of criticism, you know, regardless of what other kinds of criticisms are or are not happening. I think too, it, the, along with humility, it goes to what you were talking about earlier in terms of pleasure, right? The fear in that public face of writing, of declaring pleasure with something that we ought not to take pleasure in, you know? Um, that's the great problem with so much fiction or music um, and art is that there are things we're gonna like that we're not going to confess to. <laughs> and I think that um, uh, outlining why that happens is, is very important. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, being in this area for quite a long time, particularly Indigenous art, I've watched how Indigenous art has shown and often led the way for a whole different Indigenous formation. Um, you know, art of the 1960s that, and 70s that Indigenous artists were making were primarily directed towards white audiences and uh, rich people. And now, it's becoming much more, I don't want to say insular because indigenous people are making art for each other, but also for an international indigeneity. And that's a new way of seeing ourselves um, so, so different. Uh, and it's looking to each other and to non-European cultures rather than uh, comparing ourselves always with a British slash uh, Euro-American uh, way of seeing art. And so it's, it's really open things wide. And some of these things are I, what I consider non-critical things, things you cannot engage in critically. Um, and so discourses of pleasure uh, become very significant or discourses around uh, its uh, utility, depending on the object. And um, I haven't figured out the best way to write about that kind of thing. I don't write you know, weekly or monthly anymore, just very occasionally. Um, but I think that that's, that's a way in, um, another way in. Yeah, I think so too. And one of the things I think about I, um, a lot based on the music that I came up listening to, I think maybe is at the intersection of both of the points that you just made. So, so um, there's a bit about who's the audience, right? Um, so, um, Cannabis, who is a, a New York rapper, put it uh, nicely, said, uh, since, since it became a lucrative profession, there's a misconception that a movement in any direction is progression. <laughs> um, which, you know, I think sounds right to me, right? Like. Before, uh, I, I don't know quite when this happened, maybe the mid 80s, certainly by, certainly by the mid 90s, 
Um, but, you know, hip hop wasn't that lucrative as far as art forms go, as far as the music industry goes. Um, and I think as a result of who, who the audience was, you had a totally different social arrangement of, um, of rappers, you know, it was extremely diverse field, you know, there's since, since 96, I think, I don't think we've really seen an era much like it, but as it got commercially successful, there was a tension between the kind of new audience and class strata that it was reaching and, you know, the norms of respectability and maybe even just straight up morality that were, I think, relevant from a critical perspective. So there were all the, you know, there was all the hype about, you know, two live crew um, and gangster rap and all that, right? By the Congress people whose kids were probably going to the concerts. Um, and I think that's where, that's where I get worried about this outsider question that I started with, right? Because on the one hand, it's just correct to say like, look, if there's a moral problem somewhere, if we're talking about this kind of stuff that's pleasurable to listen to, but that is in fact, you know, like deeply, deeply problematic. Like I can't admit to most of the rap that I listened to, that I still listen to. Right, you know, um, but but you know, even but the stuff I was listening to in high school is you know uh, even further from you know where we would like to be morally, let's say. But but I think we're also fooling ourselves if we think those very criticisms don't mark the territory claimed by the you know Tipper Gores of the world and the, you know, and the finger wagging white elites who are saying this music is evil, this music is why your community is economically backward and why it has this and this social problem, you know, and, and that's not an issue of identity, right? Not, not solely an issue of identity, right? But the function of the criticism is to call attention to the content of the music for a criticism that is better directed at the content of our social structure. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to hold both of those thoughts at the same time. Cause I don't mean to say that like, it doesn't matter that rap is misogynist, right? Cause, cause it's not true, it does matter. Um, but the act of, but it, but it similarly does matter that the act of criticism um, fits into this deeply screwed up political context because of who the audience of these criticisms are, who the audience of this art is, so on and so forth. So, yeah, another dilemma and ambivalent point. Yeah, and I, I don't know if there's an answer to it, except for that kind of oscillation between appreciation, pleasure, and criticism. And so for me, I'm interested, um, especially from the hip hop era, which did it in in 96, I'm not too sure. Certainly on the top end, things got less interesting, but in lower ends, um, there's been an indigenous uh, hip hop, which is non, almost non-commercial, uh, in Australia and here and everywhere, where it serves a very particular local function and there's just something higher and more lucrative, but really has become a folk, folk work. Um, but I'm also interested in terms of thinking about uh, hip hop from that, from those 80s and 90s, which uh, 
course I was interested in, uh, uh, is that I'm, I'm looking over at a culture that uh, is not me, you know, as a white appearing indigenous person here and indigenous people I knew at the beginning did not connect and then suddenly they did, huge. Um, but it's also a form of play, you know? That work isn't, except for maybe uh, some uh, public enemy and so on, which were self-consciously critical. But um, actually, with two, that, there's a perfect example. You've got two characters. One is the critical and one is the trickster figure. And so to me, I'm interested in that oscillation between criticism and, and play. So what are these guys playing at? You know, they're, 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 they're fooling, right? They're, 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 um, there's a whole folk tradition in, in uh, black culture and in indigenous culture of that trickster figure. And what, do you, what are they playing at? And sort of they're a cautionary tale, there's some wisdom there, but it's a criticism that teases that out to find out what the value is. And why are young men listening to all this stuff? Because they're listening for, what are the instructions for masculinity at this time? Uh, what's going to work, what's not going to work. And then over time, those tropes evolve. You know, the gangster thing can only last a certain amount of time before its toxicity wears thin, even among the adepts, right? And uh, I'm interested in that on the Indigenous side equally. I mean, um, it hasn't happened in such a dramatic way, but how, how people form themselves in relation to the traditional culture versus trying to be a contemporary person is a constant tension. How do you be, be a good person in, when your tradition has been overly Christianized and it's, it's at odds with what it means to be a good Métis or a Cree person or whatever? Um, these are things that are worked out in the content, even the formal content and qualities, the kind of borrowings people have, the Indigenous constantly citing uh, Black contemporary culture and, and finding uh, similarities, analogies. So what is that? What are they playing at? You know, that's what I mean about this. What is the project? What's going on here that they're both aware of and not aware of um, is significant to me. But also spending time not looking at the top of culture, the things that appear in uh, uh, the top of uh, moneyed magazines, but in the other discourses, what's happening uh, in Facebook, what's happening in Twitter when people are exchanging, what is that criticism and what are, and really it's about, as Bell Hooks talks about, what's being valued? How do we determine the value of these things uh, as opposed to the, the billboard charts or other forms of evaluation? Yeah, I think that point, that, that last point about, you know, the where, what are the levels of discourse that we look at is really crucial, both in terms of the level of discourse about art and also art production itself. So there's a whole genre of underground rappers, which is just underground rappers complaining about mainstream rappers not being <laughs> deserving of you know, the level of success that they have, right? You, every once in a while, you know, you'll, you'll get a public enemy. And I think someone somewhere should write a dissertation about the dialectic, the Chuck D flavor flav dialectic, um because there's a lot there but yeah every now and again you'll get um a supremely self-aware kind of mainstream group but it's a lot it's a lot more common at you know lower levels of mainstream success so in the 90s you had you know underground groups like far side you know, later on, you would get underground groups um, that that were more thoughtful and but certain mainstreams, certain particular mainstream trends, um, uh, hieroglyphics, for example. And I think what a lot of these groups found was that the the level of support that they got from audiences. Um, particularly the audiences that they had been trying to reach um, was not, didn't match up with their kind of artistic intent, right? So, so groups like Hyro and Atmosphere and, um, you know, all these are people that could tour in Europe 
and so on and so forth, but might, but might not do, might not be, might not do as reliably well in the States, right? And it might be college kids that pick up their music, um, even though, you know, all the people in it are solidly working class and speaking about working class issues, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I, that's a long winded way of saying that um, this levels point that you made, you know, might find things that are completely the opposite or just totally, you know, totally unrelated to the higher crust, you know, whatever Pitchfork is saying, um, you know, whatever Rolling Stone is saying level of music discourse. So where does uh, fandom and that sort of rabid appreciation for a group or a genre fit in in your critical critical analysis? To me, you know, I rarely, you know, I rarely talk about centering, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it here. I think you mean to me the fan, the fan of either the artist or the genre, right? But like the fan is the right, is, is the central audience of art criticism as I think of it, right? And that's, that's how I wish art criticism was organized around. Don't, you know, it's fine to have, to mention things that other art critics would be thinking about, Right, you know, it's fine to, you know, make the kinds of points that other musicians would appreciate. But, you know, what the fan is, is the person who appreciates the music. And what the fan is, is just the embodiment of what music is for, what art is for. Um, and so to me, that's like the central thing and any trend in art criticism that talks to somebody else centrally whether it's activists or musicians or politicians or other art critics is getting something wrong from my point of view. Yeah, the, the fan, whether they're a critic or not, is already there. You know, they don't need a primer, but they can recognize an innovation. They can recognize uh, a creative leap. And that's where the excitement comes in for a critic then to narrate those, those things when they happen. Um, I've always been interested in, in uh, artists who have longevity, you know, who aren't the flash in the pan, however brilliant that flash was. And early on in the very early, late, or no, it would be early 80s, I uh, just fell in love with the music of Nick Cave. You know, people might not appreciate him, but he's probably got a million fans and that sustains him. And so he's able to put out an album every two years, whatever, on in perpetuity, it writes, movie scores and, and novels and so on. But I think that idea of having, whether you call it that 80s term, the idea of a discourse community, but people who get it and are there and then share, it begins with that enthusiasm. It begins with that uh, ability to read an innovation, read something that the artist is trying to do. Um, I just noticed in chat that uh, Jack wants to jump in and Jack, be nimble. Jump in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm. Um, I'm curious to follow up on something that I think both of you have been, um, you know, flying in circles around in in the midst of this conversation, which is around the kind of um, the social justice function of criticism, to put it succinctly, if crudely, um, and thinking about thinking about how that function of art criticism and, and the rise of that in recent years um, has a bearing on or sheds light on or makes us think about um, the sort of limits of art and culture in shifting material injustices that fall outside of our um, uh, outside of the fields historically and presently delineated activities. And it makes me think of something from um, your essay, Femi, I'll read a quote really quickly, it's just two sentences. One might think 
questions of justice ought to be primarily concerned with fixing disparities around healthcare, working conditions and basic material and interpersonal security, yet conversations about justice have come to be shaped by people who have ever more specific practical advice about fixing the distribution of attention and conversational power. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'd be curious to hear both of you reflect on um, the limits of the discipline of art in terms of intervening in social justice. Um, and is that just consciousness raising? Is consciousness raising sufficient enough for this field to be so dramatically, in this field of criticism specifically, to be so dramatically um, kind of reverse engineered by its function as a social justice tool? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Did you want to go first or? I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple of quick things. Um, historically, there was a debate between uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, Alain Locke about, you know, what black art should be about. Um, it's not the, probably not, not the first time even in the African-American tradition that debate happened. Certainly happened again during the civil rights movement with people like, uh, Karenga taking the side of, you know, what art is for is painting pretty pictures of the freedom fighters with assault rifles, right? Um, making that attractive to people, it plays this kind of propagandistic function um, that was Du Bois' side. And what Locke said, I really, I personally rock with, which is even if you wanted art to do that, it couldn't do that by trying to do that, right? Um, you know, it just isn't compelling, you know. I don't know if you've seen the like Karl Marx anime that Chinese Communist Party <laughs> put together. It's really fun actually, but like, it's probably not, you know, what's needed to win the world historical battle for, you know, communism over capitalism, right? I just think that the attempt to instrumentalize art in this political way is self-defeating. But even if it weren't, you know, a song is its own reward. You know, like we can do this thing where we try to make everything radical, where we try to make everything part of the revolution. And I sympathize with the draw there, but I just don't think it's, I don't think it's right. Like, I, I think even if making myself a sandwich doesn't help me, you know, defeat the capitalists, you know, there's, there's another value there, right? Lunch. And I, and, and, art is the same way like there are intrinsic points of value that we can have now and we should just take the opportunity to, to go for those kinds of value you know irrespective of what contribution they do or don't make to political struggle writ large yeah this is one of the tougher dilemmas and I go back to in the early 80s, I was um, talking to my aunt who was a nun working in the inner city of Edmonton and I was living in the inner city of Edmonton. Uh, and uh, I said, I want to volunteer at a soup kitchen, uh, the Boyle Street soup kitchen. And she said, well, that's nice, but why would you do that? And I said, well, you know, friends with these guys on the street since I was an adolescent and I, I, want, I want to serve, I want to do good. <laughs> and she said, you know, David, we've got plenty of people who can serve soup. You make art. Why don't you make art for, with, about whatever these guys? And it profoundly hit me that, you know, there's a whole range of human preferences and activities, and we don't all have to do the one thing. The suffering of somebody right next to me, I should attend to. Um, my own physical care, sure, but there's a, a reverse uh, you know, Plato's ontological hierarchy has gone in reverse now, where the, the, the most immediate suffering uh, is being seen as the pinnacle of care. Uh, 
and there aren't there isn't a lot of room for all these other things so often if the criticism is all these things that the artwork is not doing which is basically risk corresponding with the thing you want it to do that's not a failure of the artwork that's a failure of a certain kind of appreciation but especially of understanding what that activity is what it's for and god i'd hate to cite Winston Churchill, but he was talking about funding for the arts, right, when they were first going to start funding the BBC and the, the first uh, arts programs. And he say, says, uh, you know, some people were saying that this is a terrible thing, that's a, a frill. And he says, it's what we're fighting for. And all that to say is that there's a range of activities, I don't even think it's a hierarchy, a range of things that people like to do. And uh, what we're doing is we're bringing criticism from one field into the other and hoping that the artist should care. And sometimes they do and make great work about it. Um, but even the most socially active artist has a competing interest, equal or even greater, that has to do with the pleasures of the craft, the skill development, um, uh, learning from each other, all of those other things that are non, not engaged with that social practice. Um, when they come together, it's marvelous, it's wonderful, um, but sometimes not very entertaining. Uh, or something can be completely entertaining and not socially responsible. This is something we contend with all the time. But I also want to challenge the notion of the artwork standing alone. The, st the artwork stands in a field, including that critical field, uh, the galleries that it's in, the magazines, all those things. It's a big interactive organ. And that's why it's been such a pleasure to watch Indigenous art just get better and more interesting and not according to the normal realm. So right now, uh, outside of the commercial side, the Indigenous art is dominated by female Indigenous curators and makers, and also by things like that would used to be called craft, like beading that has been extraordinary. And so it can't be evaluated only as a form, formal object sitting in a space, but also the network of relations that it has generated or been generated by. So you have to have a very different kind of critical approach for doing that. And you can't just sit in your chair and look at the object and write about it. You've got to know those other connections to get that affective sense of what's going on and how it uh, intersects with certain kinds of communities. Well, that actually leads me to another question, David, and it's something that I think about often in, in relation to um, the article that I shared in the chat here that I mentioned in my introduction, which is around the kind of distinctions that you make, and I, I'm, I won't be able to remember the specific language, but um, uh, Indigenous artworks that help me out here, Indigenous artworks that um, are that have like a cultural function uh, indigenous artworks that don't have like a, a, a cultural function other than something aesthetic and then uh, indigenous contemporary art, which of course is a fusion of, um, you know, Western, Western conceptions of what contemporary art is with often tra um, traditional uh, aesthetics and practices. Um, and when I read that piece, and it's come up for me often in terms of editing people's work about Indigenous um, contemporary art, which is the kind of difference of approach that each of those call for. So I'd be really curious to hear you talk a little bit about that. And, um, and then broadly, I'd be curious to hear uh, both of you talk about the sort of question of um, method when it comes to approaching work that you might not, that one might not have a, an inherent relationship to. Yeah, so this is an entry point for non-Indigenous people um, not to treat them again as all one thing. So for me, there are three categories, three very broad categories, but they're very distinct. And the first one is the traditional object made within certain protocols and say in certain areas, they can only be made by certain members of a uh, family tradition, a, a, a lodge, or they've been mentored into that object making tradition. And each thing is an iteration of the thing that came before. And there's room for some kinds of innovation, but not so much. But the main test is that they're made for themselves, for each other's, for ceremony, whatever. Um, and they may be gifted. Uh, they may find their ways into non-indigenous collections. But the idea is that they're for that closed community. 
Uh, and in talking to people who've done those things, I'll never forget, there was a great artist, uh, Rod Sayer, who was uh, studying jewelry. This is almost 25, 30 years ago at the Alberta College of Art and Design. And he asked me and some other profs there to come in and take a look at work. And he says, here, give me your feedback on this work. And then he pointed to the ceremonial objects. You can look at these, but I'm not interested in your criticism. You've got nothing to say because nothing that I can say is going to alter what that is. It's a traditional thing. So these are non-critical forms. They're not subjects. They're not candidates for that sort of appreciation or engagement. That's not, they are outside of that discourse uh, altogether completely. Now within the community, do, does it follow protocol? Does it follow, have the right form lines? There's a criticism within that community, but it's not available for outside. The next category is Aboriginal art. And Aboriginal art is any art, whether it, it looks exactly like traditional ones or not, or has been influenced by Western art and certainly uh, methods and materials. But its test is, who's it for? If it's made and circulated, uh, within the non-Indigenous community, uh, including magazines and ethnographic discourse and all of that. That's, for me, Aboriginal art. That's the bulk of what Indigenous art or Native art is. Uh, but then there's a very special category, and it's emergent category that I call Indigenous. And this corresponds to people, right? All these categories of objects are also correlated with people. So Indigenous people, as I mentioned, don't look for uh, Western authorization or European authorization for their activities, but nor do they look for traditional appreciation. A lot of traditional communities don't even know these artists that sprung from them and they don't know the work necessarily. There's quite a divide. Um, and they may work, make their work within white paradigms and traditions and so on, but a lot of their, a lot of the elements in the work are not comprehensible by those traditions. And so they require a separate Indigenous curatoria and uh, critical writing. And with the rise of the Indigenous Curatorial Collective, which has been running now about 13, 14 years, and more writers and PhDs, this whole field is transformed. You could, we have a, a sort of a shadow art world of Indigenous creation. But as I mentioned before, the, the, the main significant aspect is turning not to indigenous, I mean, Western and European uh, traditions, but looking at indigeneity around the world, uh, both for criticism, curation, and now the circulation of those objects uh, among indigenous curators, uh, is, is, it's, it's been changed everything altogether. So it used to be you were only recognized when you were recognized by a white curator, and now there's this whole other circuit of uh, discourse and meaning. Now, the great thing, or both troubling and great thing about the indigenous is that it's comprehensible. You can study it, you can learn it. And so I did a paper a long time ago about uh, Joseph Boyden is not uh, Métis, but he is indigenous. You know, he's a white fella, but he's learned indigeneity. These are learned things. These are things you can learn. Um, so what's happened on the most sophisticated end of the indigenous is a return to community. This is the next and the biggest, most important thing, not only to uh, source materials from the land and wisdom, and there's so many indigenous people now learning their languages, uh, but finding authority in those spaces. And the ultimate achievement will be the return of indigenous art to these communities and an education that can go back and forth rather than an, just an extraction. Anyways, that's the, the summary of that. And so, when you're dealing with those self-conscious uh, indigenous works, it is subject to uh, non-indigenous critical uh, engagement and a very productive site uh, can be co-created in that space. Um, but we have very little cases where we can actually have a dialogue. Usually it's just a representation. So on the worst end, most people, critics are just reporters writing what they recognize, writing what the artist tells them and it's not a co-creative thing. Um, that emerges in catalog essays at the best, but there are very, very few non-Indigenous people writing these things because the writing has gotten so sophisticated among these Indigenous folks. Uh, that was a little long, but I hope that answered what you were <laughs> going for.
Yeah, no, that was very rich. Thank you. Uh, there's a question too that kind of dovetails nicely, but I just wanted to give Femi a, a chance to chime in if you wanted to before I pose it. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Move to the next cool. Um, okay, so this question, and by the way, now's the time to ask questions. If uh, people have them, feel free to punch, punch them in or raise your hand. Um, the question is from Lauren Fournier. I'm curious about the speaker's thoughts on the present day situation around a given artist's work perhaps not being covered or critically taken up because those outside their particular community do not feel like they quote unquote should or are the ones to, to take that on. Is this still a problem as the field of writing and criticism becomes more diverse? How ought writers navigate this ethically today? I talked a lot, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I'll say a couple of things. Um, I, I think this is a problem, um, but it's mainly a problem um, in the sense that I think um, David was explaining earlier with the pushback against viewing art as a kind of, you know, standalone object free of relations, right? There's actually to do good art criticism, you know, or, or I'll put it this way, better art criticism, in my view, involves knowing a lot of things, right? Only some of which are about melody and lyrics or, you know, angles or, you know, good shots, good camera work, whatever, whatever fits the medium, right? Um, those are obviously particularly aesthetically important things, but there's this broader network of relationships that artistic objects exist within. And, you know, I, I do, you know, I'm a standpoint epistemology guy, right? I think, you know, not everybody has that knowledge. Um, not all of that knowledge is immediately accessible to any particular person. All that knowledge is even in principle accessible to any particular person, right? And so I think it is a problem, but I think of it more of a problem of kind of institutional design than of personal ethics, right? We should have, we should have the proliferation of knowledges that makes more art accessible in this deep way to more critics and criticism, right? It's a contingent fact that, you know, a lot of publications don't have indigenous people or trans people or um, uh, African people doing, you know, significant editorial work and contributing to a culture that circulates the knowledge for significant editorial work, even for people that aren't themselves African or aren't themselves um, trans or aren't themselves um, indigenous, right? So I think, you know, we should, it's, it's less, I think of this in a more constructive kind of way. We should be trying to build publications and music criticism networks that would not have this problem rather than trying to think, you know, rather than trying to level this problem at individual people, right? I think everybody should do the best that they can from where they're at in whatever it is that they decide to review. And I generally don't think that they should say, you know, well, I'm not the right identity to review this kind of work, but I do think people should be honest with themselves about what kinds of limitations their identity and their knowledge um, puts on the kinds of criticisms that they can do effectively. Um, and the, yeah, maybe I'll stop there. It's, it's such an interesting thing because a lot of this happens behind the scenes. Well, first of all, I wanna comment on the institutional design. There's absolutely no question that uh, if you don't have subjects of the type Outside of that uh, usual paradigm, you're not going to have a paradigm shift. And as soon as you do, and they can be supported and sustained, um, then things change. 
uh, hopefully improve uh, by bringing in more kinds of discourses. But from the writerly point of view, it's such an interesting problem, right? So when you're writing about something that is not closely related to you, you I just think it's not possible anymore to take an imaginary um, disinterested position. You're, you're interested. And so often what happened, at least in the early days in the 90s, people were writing hyper subjective uh, critical writing and they were really creating a, a corresponding text, almost another creative work. Sometimes those were interesting, sometimes they weren't because they avoided so many issues and they ended up being um, uh, yeah, personal reflections that didn't serve the artwork. And that's why I mean the importance of the humility of the object, recognizing that there's an object there full of intention, full of possibilities that the artist may or may not know and trying to read it, try to restore it, try to, to bring it into this other language is really important. But here's where the editor becomes the most important aspect of the game, because there's the dialogue. The dialogue is between that person who's not good enough, not understanding enough, but is driven by fandom, <laughs> by appreciation or disgust or whatever the emotion is. And the editor then works with them to make sure they don't make a fool of themselves. And that just means they don't understand some of the obvious tropes that people have agreed upon at the moment and uh, make sure if they're gonna step in it, then um, they, they do so consciously. So that is a deeply interesting thing. Now, maybe somebody can weigh in to tell me what happened at Canadian Art, but it seemed to be exactly this kind of crisis, um, but I could be wrong, it might've been just a financial problem. But each of the institutions right now, so in Can the Canada Council is becoming a social agent. It always was, but it's being a hyper social agent and is gonna defund things that don't operate according to these new tropes. So learning what they are and even questioning them is essential to right now. And the editor, just like the curator is the key player. I was talking to a grad student the other day and I was sharing this, you know, so, Musicians, you got producers. Uh, the, if you're a writer, you got an editor. Uh, every, every discipline in the fine arts has this intermediate person, uh, but not the visual arts. The visual arts have curators, but they come late in the game. At no point do they come in early. So our visual artists make all these crazy things and they desperately, desperately need this reflect, critical reflection. And maybe we can come up with formats of like uh, indigenous talking circles or non-confrontational, non-published, non-public forms of uh, critical discourse, something. Um, but the current one is not working too well. Sorry, I was just taking a note. Um, that's a great idea, private forums. Because I, yeah, I get the sense often that it has a lot to do with fear of public retribution in a, a court of public opinion. So, uh, so yeah, that's. In, in well, for for about a decade now, different groups, usually around universities and um, shirt grants and whatever, have been conducting these talking circles where academics and non-academics artists get together and they talk in a circle for a day or four hours or whatever it is, and. Yeah, those academics will do a paper or something for like five or 10 minutes, um, but it's an exchange. And that's how mm -hmm. it's not confrontational, but it's generative. Uh, and it, uh, it, they're hugely critical because there's certain, you know, people are misspeaking according to, you know, they don't quite have the education or the, they're not part of the, the reading community or whatever, but they know something. Mm -hmm. They're doing something that brought them to that circle. And we learn from each other. And it's been more important to me than any other readings or anything else I might go to. And so I think that if artists could come together that way, uh, Laurent Fournier and I were, I conducted this, one of these circles in uh, Montreal and uh, it was too big, too many people, but it was, I, how we learned from each other was ex extraordinary because you're not presenting, you know, you're not this representational mode you're actually there to learn. And the circle goes with everybody has their bit and then there could be a free exchange. 
Um, but anyways, though, I, I'm thinking about other forms of criticism or critical engagement uh, that could happen at an exhibition, for instance, where someone really wants to learn what people, how the people have received their work. Um, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, it relates to like another question that kind of came up as this, as this conversation was being devised around um, asking for consent and whether we're in a mode where um, standpoint epistemology is so deeply fixed as, as a sort of, um, uh, how do I say, it's so deeply fixed in the culture of um, writing criticism and thinking about writing criticism and choosing to not write criticism that one of the questions that came up is what would it look like for someone to ask for consent from uh, the artist whose work they were they were choosing to engage with and uh, I'd be curious to hear you reflect on it, on questions of consent and how that rubs up against certain you know formal protocols that are upheld in criticism. So, namely, that when a critic when a critic is engaging with an artist's work, they engage with the work itself, which is the sum of what the artist consciously consciously decided was for a public, rather than trying to fish around in the artist's biography or private life or trying to forge a personal relationship. So. I'd be curious to hear both of you reflect on whether that feel, uh, what the potentials of that feel like and um, how they rub up against, yeah, these protocols and criticism, which, um, and to be clear, I'm not talking about the kind of maintaining the objective distance, because we all know that's not really ever been a thing uh, in any real way, but uh, more like, um, it, the, the absence of a personal relationship or the seeking of details that are about the, the person rather than about their work. So for me, sorry to jump this one, I'm just so excited by it. No one's asked me this one before, <laughs> but uh, that's why those three categories are so important to me. So in the first category of the traditional um, person, absolutely consent is required, right? Because you're bringing one discourse community into the other and there's so much to negotiate in terms of protocol to make that equitable. For the Aboriginal art, that's in the fair play of marketplace. And uh, they put it, as you say, they put it out there for criticism or whatever. But for me, uh, that indigenous category, that's where the writer is looking at an equal. And that's why I'm interested more in a dialogue and a discourse. But I don't want someone to ask me for consent. Here I work at a university and I refuse that. I was asked to do ethic review when I was going to go and uh, interview some colleagues, some indigenous artists in Australia. And I absolutely refused that, that assumed that I was a superior agent, that I had something this other person lacked when it's completely the opposite, but it's also a dialogue among peers and equals. And so the question is, are you going there as an equal? And what I've been really enjoying and spending time with anthropologists lately is the ones I'm talking to actually believe that these people are their peers. It's not just lip service. They actually believe that, that they can learn from them and that they have a legitimate worldview that is distinct from their own. And it's not just a, another entry. Anyways, I've been very much moved by um, ethnographers and anthropologists who are actually transformed by cultures, not their own. Um, and there's going to be all kinds of play. But when an artist is putting something there, in the discourse of ideas or the marketplace, it's fair game. And I don't want uh, them reading my copy before I sent it out, you know? In this, uh, anyways, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I, I don't have too much to add, but I think my, my inclination is that there are several points at which artists get to make decisions about the publicity of their art. And I mean the publicity in the sense of like how it's marketed, but, but I mean to what extent it's public. 
right? You get to decide whether to use your your given name, a family name, or a or a stage name, right? You get to decide, you know, whether to give interviews to journalists who might want to do profiles. I mean, a lot of this applies mostly to famous artists, but there's versions of this for, for every. Um, you get to decide whether to make your work explicitly autobiographical, right? You can say, this is a thing that happened to me before you play the song. You can name the characters after yourself in your film. And I think for me, it's really about respecting those decisions. Um, all of those decisions are ethically loaded. None of those decisions involve stances that are limited to the artists themselves, right? They have, they have families, they have communities, and there are ethical obligations of both the artist and the critic to both of those. And, you know, this is something that we have to negotiate and something that just producing art doesn't negotiate by itself. We need other norms to help us say, you know, what is it that a person means to do when they put out an album under their own name? Do they mean that anybody that they went to elementary school with becomes part of, you know, the origin story of this album? You know, maybe if the title of the album is Elementary School Life, you know, maybe not if it's just about, <laughs> if it's just about something else, right? But, you know, um, but there's a negotiation to be had. Um, and so I think kind of mindful, careful, dialogical way of negotiating specific boundaries of access and specific boundaries of um, kind of non-access or respectful distance is, is something that we have to figure out as an art culture and an artistic culture. Critical writing is a form of the essay, right? And essay is a notion of trying. And so what I'm hearing too and agree with is this notion of respectful trying. You know, um, for me, that's why I don't like the fully subjective things that are works of play themselves. And, but the ones that are critically aware of their Eth the ethical dilemmas of, you know, you were framing it at the beginning of speaking for, but I also, I think when there's a sort of dialogical attempt, uh, you're speaking with, you know, you're, you're, you're both trying to get at something and hopefully that something goes beyond the, the subject that you are occupying at this moment. And certainly I've read critical writing in fiction generally or non-fictional writing where the artist is more than their apparent subject position. They're also constructed of so many other texts or songs or works of art that exceed who they appear to be. And, and it's that kind of playful critical text that when you resonate with, even though you feel you shouldn't because you're not of the same race, gender or class or whatever, but you do because it's a true thing. And it won't be every statement be true, but many of them will be true. And so that idea of respectful trying is essential and not feeling, and this is where the, the editor has, is in the, the greatest position of care, where they're trying to anticipate the kind of reception that critical text will receive and prepare the writer for that potential blowback. And so I'm at a stage right now that I can write about Kent Muckman uh, critically, um, but I probably wouldn't have dared at a more vulnerable stage in my career. Um, so again, there's all these different positions within the position. Um, but my greatest appreciation right now is young writers, Indigenous women writers, particularly uh, who are writing fearlessly out of their subject position. And they're simply disinterested in all those things that I might have held dear. And they're convincing me of the significance and centrality of all the things they care about. And so their uh, rhetorical persuasion uh, 
uh, I can't escape, you know, it's, it's, it's overwhelming and wonderful. Um, and it, it changes me and expands me. And I'm then, therefore not as limited in my subject position as I would have been prior to reading that wonderful text. Okay, well, wow, thank you so much for both, both of you for all of that. It's been really um, humbling to have you in the mix on these questions and uh, grateful for your insights. I've posted uh, both David and Femi's texts in the chat for anyone who's curious. Um, thank you to all the attendees for joining us tonight. Uh, the next public event in our symposium is Originary Scenes of Ficto Criticism then to now, which is a performance lecture by Jane Randolph on November 24th at 6 Eastern. Um, to register for the event or for future ones, visit the link in the chat. I think Alex posted it at the beginning of the event. Um, we're also offering a 33% discount on subscriptions to attendees of today's program. So if the work that we do means something to you, visit special.cmagazine.com to claim the offer. Thanks again and take care, everyone. Thanks so much for hosting, Jack, and great to meet you, Femi. Nice to meet you, David. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bye. everybody.